Everywhere on the face of the earth, throughout all time, men have fought either individually or in armies to merit belonging to the finest legion of the human race, the fighters for freedom of thought and conscience, for freedom of spirit and action. This is the story of one of those legions, a legion of common men who fought and died over 300 years ago in England for the dignity of human freedom. The NBC University of the Air presents We Came This Way, a new historical series for our listeners at home and overseas. With John W. Vandercook as narrator, we present Chapter 8, a story of a battle without armor in We Came This Way. They call the English Civil War the Puritan Revolution. Like all great events, it is infinitely complicated. But if we could take a scalpel and cut through to the heart of English history, we would find two chambers there through which a nation's lifeblood pulsed, the palace and the House of Commons. The common man of 1625 thought his civil rights had been given him by the Magna Carta. A man of sober habits, he believed in freedom of religion and popular rights. The courtiers reviled him as a Puritan. The king found him troublesome and answered all demands for civil liberty by making arbitrary proclamations, imprisoning at pleasure, dictating religion. Both the king and the common man believed they were right. In 1642, the showdown came in civil war. Who was to rule England, the king or the House of Commons? A man went out to make the answer on a battlefield in his native land. He now lies mortally wounded, dying, while the battle goes on around him. How tall a blade of grass looks when the ground is your pillow. How near the heavens. How much a man can see when he is entering the valley of the shadow. I shall be in the valley soon. It can't last much longer. The staining of the earth with my lifeblood. And when it's over, when I have passed through the valley, and I'm called to judgment, what then? How shall I face my maker, I who have just killed my fellow men? You will soon have to justify your ways to the Almighty. Prepare your soul's defense. For you are guilty of breaking the Lord's commandment. Thou shalt not kill. What shall I say? That I had no murder in my heart for any man. Is it sufficient unto the evil done that my conscience regarded it the greater evil to let a man's spirit be stamped as a coin is into conformity? Yet, heavenly sovereign, that is why I took up arms in a bloody rebellion against Charles Stuart, once my earthly sovereign. I and others of his subjects had to call this man of blood to account for the blood he shed and the misery he did unto the people of England. O oh, eternal judge of all men's deeds, though I come now before thee with stained hands, I beseech thee to judge me only as a soldier by the cause for which I took the life of mine enemy. By my faith, I, Peter Holborn, a printer by trade, called a Puritan rascal by the king's men, do declare I killed five of these men in battle at Shalgrove on June 18th, 1643, for the cause of human liberty. This cause was shown to me seven years ago, one morning after prayer. Peter, Peter, they've been here. The king's men looking for you. Yes, I see they've left the usual signs. Smashed book plates, torn manuscripts. Don't stay in the shop. Come inside. Hurry, before they pass this way again. 
Letitia, this isn't the first time they've come after me. But it's not like the other times. If you hadn't been at prayer, they'd have taken you. Andrew and Thomas and the shipwrights helpers who were dragged out of their homes like cattle. Peter, for my sake, pay the tax. I can't. We have it. Yes, we do. What have those two poor to pay? Conscripted as punishment. Sent out to be slaughtered wherever the king chooses to make war. No, Letitia. I won't ransom myself merely because the Lord has favored us with his provision. Who will it help if you are taken away too? Before I'm taken, there are things to be said that need to be said. One voice. One voice can become a cry that will frighten even a tyrant like Charles Stewart. And I raised my voice in the spreading shout of the printed word. I composed pamphlets by night while I hid from the king's men by day. And the word was taken up. Meaning no offense, good man, can you read? If a man read the scriptures, what else need he read? Such as may make him curious. Such as this pamphlet just passed to me in the alehouse. What matter is in it? Let me see. Matter enough to hang you and set all England aflame. Hang me? What for? Sedition. Listen to this. Englishman, the petition of right granted us immunity from the king... If we refuse to yield money asked without the consent of Parliament. What Parliament granted the king the right to tax us? Charles Stewart hasn't let Parliament meet in 11 years. Don't pay unless the king calls Parliament. Let the people decide if they want to tax themselves. Night after night, I kept printing pamphlets. Letitia was always at my side. What shall we tax ourselves for? So the king can war on Scotland? What is his majesty's war against the Scots that justifies the blood of Christians? All the Scots want is to worship in their own fashion. Go on, Letitia, read the rest. Does our king fear the Scots may set us an example? Then let all true Englishmen justify his fears. Peter, this pamphlet, it's worse than the others. Worse? No one's dared to speak thus against his majesty. If they should trace it to you... Then they'll have the guilty one. How could you be so... so calm, knowing what it would mean? Would you have me otherwise, Letitia? If a man be of faith, let his work speak for it. My press speaks for me. I would not have you otherwise, Peter. Ah, there. These pamphlets should be enough. I'll take them to the marketplace. No, Letitia. If a man be of faith, why not his wife also? Oh, it's almost dawn. I must be off. Night is such a long time in the coming, waiting. I'm never far from you. Have no fear. John Hampton hides me well on his estate. Oh, Peter, when will all this end? It's just beginning. Peter, look, the king's men outside. Give me those pamphlets. There's no place to hide here. Leave everything. That's him. Get him. No, no, leave him alone. Don't be afraid, Letitia. Fear only the Lord and nothing else. Oh, is that you, Buckingham? Where have you banished yourself until dawn? Sire, I have that pamphleteer for you. Pamphleteer? England reeks with pamphleteers. This one has caused the greatest stench. He wants you to beg commons for money to carry on the holy war against Scotland. Who is it, Buckingham, that wants the crown to go begging? A Bible-mongering Puritan. Peter Holborn by name. Another one of those solemn-faced rascals? Buckingham... Let's see how righteous the devil can look with both his ears cut off. (laughs) I have better sport, Your Majesty. The expedition against Scotland sets out tomorrow. Is it not fitting for Your Majesty to respect a Puritan's faith? Is it, Buckingham? Is it? Yes, Your Highness. If that Puritan is forced to go afoot on a holy pilgrimage to Scotland bearing a musket... And thus, I too became a member of that ragged army of the lame, the halt, and the unwilling who had been conscripted from among the poor. You know the law. If you don't pay the tax, you're in His Majesty's army. But I don't have a farthing to my name. Then His Royal Highness puts private in front of your name. (laughs) Come on. Into the wagon, all of you. Let him alone. He's sick. Let my husband alone. Come on, march. Oh, take care of my children. No. March, I said. 
Get up there before you get my boot in your face. He can't. His heart's given out. Who gave you the command to stop? March. Surely you will let us bury him. Pray for him. I'll let you march. Fall in there. March. While we staggered on to Scotland with more hatred and disaffection for our king than toward his enemies, which we would soon face, at home, Liberty found an able champion in John Hampton, rich country gentleman of Buckinghamshire, who had once hidden me on his estate. John Hampton, a trained lawyer and member of parliament, decided to take up the fight against the king legally. Writ against John Hampton Esquire to show why some assessed by the crown against you should not be satisfied. Because, Sheriff, the matter contained in the writs do not legally compel me to comply. Oh, come now, Mr. Hampton. Pay the tax and have an end to the matter. What is 20 shillings to a man like you? A matter of principle. Begging your pardon, Mr. Hampton, but it's a matter of principle for me to arrest those who refuse to pay. I'm ready. You mean you really want to go to the gatehouse for 20 shillings? Why not into the army? The Crown wants rich men in prison for refusing to obey. Good. Then I'll have to stand trial. For 20 shillings? What do you want to make an example of yourself for? To win our country's freedom from the Crown. <laughs> Honorable judges of the King's Bench, the Crown contends that the 20 shillings tax on my Stokes Mandeville estate is not an ordinary measure but one levied for the defense of the realm. This tax, called ship money, is for the supposed provisions of vessels to guard the channel. I say the greater danger is from within. I refuse to pay this tax because it has been levied without the consent of Parliament. The opinion of the King's Bench is that the levying of money for the defense of the realm... Day after day, the trial went on. Not the King. While the conscripted stumbled ever closer to Scotland to fight the king's war, John Hampton continued to fight the people's war in the court of the exchequer. The people must control. In the people lies the supreme jurisdiction. In the king lies the supreme jurisdiction. He's an absolute monarch and holdeth the kingdom under none but God himself. The king is answerable only unto himself. The king must be answerable to the people. Honorable judges of the crown, I cannot, I will not, on my conscience as an Englishman, submit to this tax. I would pay 1,000 pounds if Parliament asked me, but not one shilling to the king. I shall not be taxed by any others but my elected peers. Sergeant at arms, take him out. Commit me to prison. But the walls will not keep back the knowledge from the people that Charles Stewart is bent on destroying the public liberty for which so many Englishmen have died. Mark this well. This trial may yet prove the most fateful in our history. And so it did, leading to the bloody rebellion in which I, Peter Holborn, was wounded mortally. It was John Hampton's trial that set the small fires burning all over England until they united in the great blaze that swept the land, burning Puritan and Royalist alike in the heat of civil war. Heard the town crier? The king's bench voted against Hampton, seven to five. Dirty cowards, those seven who did him in. He did him in. He told him off, he did. Wants none to take a shillings but his peers. Well, so does I. I tell you, it'll end in heads rolling. The rabble wants to rule. It's the Puritans. They started it. Kill the Puritans. Kill the Royalists. Kill the Puritans. Kill the Though no Englishman could speak through the shuttered House of Commons, still the voice of the people was heard as far as Scotland, where His Majesty King Charles had gone to watch us die in his war. And the cry of the people forced him to call his army to a halt before the battle was joined. Kill the royalists, is it? Blasted rebel. I'll whip it out of them, that and the money. Oh, there's a better way, Your Majesty. How's that, Wentworth? What's better than a whip against fools? To slay the game of fools and beat them at it. Your Highness does not have enough money to fight the Scots. What would you have me do, Wentworth? The Scots are across the river. Look at my collection of ragged beggars that stand ready to run. The Scots won't move until you do. It would be unwise to fight now, Your Majesty. The time to move is when you have thorough government in England. 
as I have in Ireland. Thought of enough to give you a good army and enough money to keep fighting. But what of the Scots across the river? If I retreat now... Make a treaty with the religious rebels until you are in a position to write a better one. And so Charles Stewart signed the Treaty of Berwick, solemnly agreeing to let the men of Scotland practice their religion according to their own conscience. Both sides disbanded their troops. I could go home, home to a wife's greeting. Peter, Peter, thank the Lord you're home. Home to fight by the best means I knew of, printing pamphlets to arouse the people. Peter, what is this? A new folio of Shakespeare's sonnets. Yes, on the cover it is. But this is a strange sonnet. A warning to the people of England to beware of thorough government now that Wentworth, Lord Deputy of Ireland, is in England to advise his majesty. Advice to Wentworth? Consider it well, your majesty. You need funds for the war against Scotland. You can't get it without the consent of Parliament. Why not call Parliament and have them vote you money? <laughs> Those rascals wouldn't grant me a shilling. But if your majesty would grant amnesty to the Puritan heretics, to John Hampton and the others in jail... And is that thorough government? It can come in easy stages, sire. Men can be bought, cajoled, lulled. Then, relieved of their freedom step by step. Wentworth, or shall I say the Earl of Strafford for your services? I thank you, sire. Strafford will take the first step and summon Parliament. Read this pamphlet, Letitia, for the sense it makes. John Hampton has promised to read it in Parliament tomorrow. Parliament, you meet for the first time in 11 years. Beware the king's sudden favor. Now that the king's minion... The Duke of Buckingham has been stabbed to death in the... The people of England are to be stabbed in the back by the king's new minion, the Earl of Strafford. <laughs> the honourable member from Buckinghamshire will confine his remarks to the resolution on hand. Shall Parliament grant the king a subsidy in return for abandoning the ship money tax? I am dealing with the resolution on hand. Why can't I tell you the name of the author of this pamphlet? For fear of the Crown's action against him. I say grant His Majesty none of the money he asks for until Englishmen are permitted to speak as they think. <laughs> grant him nothing until he ceases to attack other men's form of worship. Grant him nothing. England spoke, but not for long. This Parliament met three weeks and then was stifled. So was I. Peter. John? They're coming here to church. Who? The royal guards. They've traced the pamphlet to you. Leave I here I have before... not finished my devotions. Finish them elsewhere. The Lord comes before any man. When I have done with prayers, then I shall go, not before. Stay in your pews, everyone. We've come for Peter Harvard. Where is he? The Lord be with thee, Peter. He shall be with me. Where is Peter Holborn? Speak before we take on into the tower. I am Peter Holborn. Will you join me in a prayer for the salvation of our king? Make the Puritan lout stand in the pillory. Grand S.L., seditious libeler on both his cheeks. Set an example, your majesty. Yes, Wentworth. Tell the star chamber to find him 5,000 pounds and then send him to solitary confinement. It's time I began to govern thoroughly. And thus I fell into the hands of mine enemy, who was made to walk the path to the pillory. But the way was strewn with flowers, and the humble people of England followed me to Palace Yard, where my cheeks were branded. <gasps> oh. Oh. There I stood, where the people turned away from the sight. My wife ascended the platform and wept before me. Peter. Don't cry, Letitia. Oh, my poor husband. Pity your king instead. He stands condemned here. Does it hurt the burn on your cheeks? What can I do to take away your pain? 
Believe with me, Letitia. Through all the dark days ahead, that all will yet be well with us and England. And not only my days were dark, but lonely in the solitary confinement of a stone cell. Let me see my husband. I haven't seen him in a year. Petition not granted. His Majesty's orders are Peter Holborn's not to see anyone for the rest of his life. But prayer sustained me. And faith that beyond the walls that held me were other men who would batter down the walls of tyranny. In East Anglia, a man had risen who had only the fear of God in him, Oliver Cromwell. Every deed of the king against his people ensures his own destruction. King Charles will fall if he heeds not his subjects. And Pym, able statesman and member of an old family. It is treason for a king to debase the spirit of his subjects. I had rather suffer for speaking the truth than that the truth should suffer for want of my speaking. Apart, these iron men of freedom could do little, but Providence brought about the means of their acting together. You will have to call another Parliament, Your Majesty. What, Wentworth? And have the Puritan rascals mock me with sedition? What if Parliament were not composed of Puritans, but of men loyal to you? Then you could get money for your war against the Scots. <laughs> the House of Commons loyal to me? Have you turned miracle worker? Well, the Puritans will need a miracle, not we, Your Majesty. There are 40 days to election if you convene Parliament. Much could happen in 40 days. And much did happen. Perhaps enough to set an example to all free men from our time on. It was John Hampton who saw into the heart of the matter. The Royalists are running for election. Pym, we must fill the House of Commons with men loyal to the people. How? It is the people who decide. Some of them may not understand what the candidates stand for. Pym, we must go electioneering. Electioneering? What is that? Explaining the candidates to the people. Then we will be certain the king will not pack the House of Commons with his men. But that's like fighting a campaign without armor. No, Pym. We have the armor, the righteousness of our cause. And our weapon is the sword of the people, the vote and I am with you in explaining where to cast that weapon. For 40 days and 40 nights, John Hampton and Pym rode over the country, urging freeholders to give their votes to the Puritan candidates. Never had men done this before. Remember, behind every law is the will of the people. It is your sacred right to vote. Vote Puritan. The issue is clear. Absolute monarchy or freedom. Vote Puritan. John Hampton for Parliament. A vote for Pym is a vote for purity, morals, and government. Cromwell for freedom of religion and sober government. <laughs> And the Parliament that Wentworth, Earl of Strafford, had promised His Majesty would be a pool of still waters in which Charles Stuart could cast royal pebbles became instead a rising tide of democratic opinion. The Honourable Member from Buckinghamshire resolved that the Crown no longer have the power to dismiss Parliament at whim. Resolve that Parliament meet every three years. Whether the Crown convenes it, or not? Aye, 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 aye. The Honorable Member from East Anglia, Oliver Cromwell, resolved there shall be freedom of worship for all men, for all creeds. Aye, aye, aye. The rebel is placing itself above the crown. I'll have an end to it and to them. Your Majesty, I place my army of Ireland at your disposal. They will yes, teach Parliament manners. Parliament. 
Information has reached me that the Earl of Strafford will offer King Charles the use of his Irish army to subjugate us. I move for the impeachment of Strafford. The charge? High treason. The penalty of guilty, the executioner's acts. <laughs> The axe fell, and with it many a good man of England, for now swords were drawn on both sides and the temper of Puritan and Royalist had passed beyond words. The King's marched on Parliament to arrest John Hampden. No man in England safe now. Our King is marching on Hull to seize the munitions. Long live Charles Stuart. Death to Charles Stuart. Death, to, Charles Death Charles to the Puritans. Death to Charles Stuart. The first blood was shed at Manchester, and thus civil war began. The political prisons were opened and I was released. I went home, not to stay, but to say goodbye to my wife. Peter, you can't go. Letitia, for years I fought with pamphlets. Now the time has come to take up the sword. Oh, Peter, come back to me. Come back. I shall not go back. I fought under the banner of John Hampton until, until I fell here at Shawgrove. Hampton, too, has fallen somewhere near me. There will be many battles before it is over, but I have no fear of the outcome. Neither, O oh heavenly sovereign, shall I fear thy judgment, which I shall soon face. For the blood that was shed was done in the name of liberty. The sky, the sky is nearer. Heavenly Father, I, I commit myself to your mercy. Forgive our enemy, for truly they, they knew not what they did. Not only Peter Holman, but many other good Englishmen, John Hampton, and unknown men from the towns and villages died at Shalgrove, fighting other Englishmen for a principle. It took many more battles to establish once and for all that absolute monarchy in England was gone. At Marston Moor on July 2nd, 1644, the Royalists were beaten decisively by a new leader of the people who had emerged, Oliver Cromwell. While Cromwell was more interested in freedom of religion than in civil rights, the men who followed him during the turbulent days of the Commonwealth did plant to the idea of representation firmly into the soil of English government, where it has never been uprooted. The Puritan Revolution lives today in our Bill of Rights. NBC University of the Air has brought you Chapter 8 of the historical series We Came This Way. Next week, We Came This Way will present the story of Education for Freedom. Tonight's script was written by Harry Kleiner and directed by Ira Avery. The original music is composed by Leo Kempinski and conducted by Milton Catons. Featured members of the cast were Louis Van Ruten, Joseph Wiseman, Cecil Roy, and Martin Wolfson. Your narrator was John W. Vandercook. This is the National Broadcasting Company.